I'm Christian. Those words don't fit together. It's like saying you went out to Hawaii on business. <laughs> Those who face the reality of Calvary can no longer live for selfish pleasure. Our redemption demands total consecration. What do you think would happen if believers really came into the reality, if they grasped the wonder of the cross and realized more fully what was really happening there? I tell you, they would become overwhelmed by the dimensions of their redemption and they would become compulsive worshipers. They would go around and talk about the Lord to anyone who would be willing to listen. Day after day. This is what would happen. They would be unashamedly enthusiastic about the one who called them out of darkness into his marvelous light. Worldly ambitions would perish. As they gave themselves without reserve to Christ and to his service. I said to a young man, a friend of mine up there on the West Coast recently, Jeff, if people really believe the truth of what happened at Calvary, what would happen? He said to me, the world would be evangelized. But that's true. An unevangelized world is testimony to the fact that the church has lost the wonder The church has lost the wonder. The world takes it all rather matter-of-factly, as you know. The death of the Lord Jesus on the cross at Calvary doesn't impact us the way it should. In fact, we may be so conceited that we might think it was a jolly good thing for him to do for us anyway. That maybe it was the proper thing, after all, for him to do it. Such vain conceit. But you know, every once in a while, a shaft of light does break through the darkness on some man or woman, some young man or woman, where a believer stands before the cross and prays, Oh, make me understand it. Help me to take it in but it meant to thee the Holy One to bear away my sin. And God hears that prayer in heaven and he looks down on that dear person. And that person's life is never the same again. Never the same again. He goes forth and people think he's lost his mind. He has, but he's found the mind of Christ. They think he's beside himself, but he is. He's, he's for God. They think he's out of step, but they don't realize he's marching to the drumbeat of a different drummer. As the significance of what happened at Calvary dawns upon him, he stands there before the cross, and he says, I've seen a vision. And for self, I cannot live. Life is worse than worthless, unless all I give. People like that can never be satisfied again with a bland Christian life. They, they determine that they will never lower themselves again to the chill of their environment. Which incidentally, friends, is a very easy thing to do. To lower yourself to the chill your environment. They realize that the Christianity that they see around them today is not the Christianity of the Bible. A new drive takes hold of them and it consumes their waking hours. And they don't want anything to come between their souls and total commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. What is it that has made these people so different? Well, I'd like to suggest to you four things. Four things. First of all, 
they've seen who Jesus really is. Secondly, they've seen what he did for them. Thirdly, they've had a tremendous revelation of who we are, the ones for whom the Savior died. And finally, they, they think of the tremendous blessings that have flowed, have flowed to us from the cross of Calvary. And we, want to, we want to consider these life-changing truths this evening. Who the Lord Jesus is. What he did. The people for whom he did it. And the blessings that have flowed to us as a result of that wonderful work. Who the Lord Jesus is. Leave him out and I tell you there's no meaning to life at all. Life is a sick joke without Jesus. It really is. He's the hub of history, the fountain of satisfaction, and he's the embodiment of reality, the central fact of life. Who is he? He's unique. The virgin-born son of Mary, he was unique from the very outset. Others are born to live. He was born to die. Usually when a baby is born into the world, there's great joy. When he was born into the world, the king was troubled and all the people of Jerusalem were troubled uh, with two. Throughout his life, people were either for him or against him. There was no middle ground. He's unique, but he's more than that. He's true man. He's true man. He was human. He grew hungry thirsty and weary. To his contemporaries he seemed quite normal in physical appearance. Uh, he was one of us. In his 20s he was a carpenter in Nazareth. In uh, his 30s, the early 30s, he was an itinerant teacher going around uh, preaching, teaching and healing. And no one had any reason to doubt his true humanity. But he was more than that. He was sinless man. He was sinless man. There was something that distinguished his humanity from all others. And that is that it was sinless. Just think of it. There was once a man who walked the streets of this earth who was absolutely free from sin. Hard to take in. Isn't it? Never an evil thought, never uh, a bad motive or a sinful act in that wonderful life. Tempted from without, he was never tempted from within. It was not possible for him to sin. He said, I always do those things that please my father. Well, that precluded sin, didn't it? Huh. If he always did those things that pleased his father, that left no room uh, for sin. I'm intrigued by the fact that even people who didn't particularly claim to be his friends had to acknowledge that he was without sin. Pilate said, I can't find any fault in him. Pilate's wife said, have thou nothing to do with this just person? Herod said, I don't see that there's anything worthy of death in him. The dying thief said, this man has done nothing amiss. And Judas himself confessed that he had betrayed the innocent blood. <coughs> yes, the Lord Jesus is unique. He's truly human and he's sinlessly human, but that's not all. We never can comprehend a fraction of the magnitude of the meaning of Calvary until we remember he's God. Yes, that one, that one hanging in the middle cross, dear friends, is God incarnate. God in a body of flesh. Isaiah identified him as the mighty God. And God the Father addressed his son 
as God. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. And John says the Word became flesh, dwelt among us. The Word was with God, was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. I could only refer to the Lord Jesus, God. And the Lord Jesus Himself insisted that everyone should honor Him as they honor the Father, which means that He's God. He's equal with God in every respect. Over 100 scriptures leave no room for argument. Jesus Christ is God. In Him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. You know, John Wesley really caught the wonder of the Incarnation when he wrote, Our God contracted to a span, incomprehensibly made man. What's a span? The difference between your thumb and your little finger there. Our God contracted to a span, incomprehensibly made man. And William Billings, who was a tanner and a musical amateur by trade, he wrote, Come see your God extended in the straw. Another poet, now unknown, said, Lo, within a manger lies he who built the starry skies. And yet another anonymous author penned these words, Lo, cold on the cradle the dew drops are falling, Lo, lies his head with the beasts of the stall. Angels adore him in slumber recalling, Maker and monarch, <coughs> Savior of all. I like that British uh, hymn writer who wrote down from his glory, ever-living story, my God and Savior came, and Jesus is his name. My God and Savior came. Dear friends, the young Jew of Nazareth was the Ancient of Days. It was God the Son who wore that carpenter's apron amid all the sawdust of that shop in Nazareth. It was God the Son who got down that day with his disciples and washed their feet. And I asked another, I have a way of asking questions. I asked another young friend recently, how would you like it if, if the Lord Jesus, God the Son, got down and washed your feet? He said, I wouldn't like it. And what he meant was, there's something, it should be the other way around. There's something improper about that. <laughs> he said, I wouldn't like it. I knew just exactly... Uh, what he meant. It was the Son of God who created optic nerves for that man in John chapter 9 who was blind from birth. And no one but God would stand up in that boat on the Sea of Galilee and say, Peace be still, and the winds and the waves obey his will. Only, only God could raise a Lazarus after he had been dead and in the tomb for four days. I don't think we can comprehend uh, the meaning of Calvary until we see that the one who hung there was the one who stretches out the heavens, lays the foundations of the earth, and forms the spirit of man within it. We tend to make our God in our own image and in our likeness. God said that to his people in the Old Testament. Uh, you thought that I was all together as you are. <coughs> we tend to make him in our own image and after our own likeness. But he's more than that. That's who he is. Think of what he did uh, for us. And I want to tell you, dear friends, if we stop to think tonight of what he really did for us, we'll be just crushed with sensory overload. The death of God incarnate on the cross of Calvary is enough to stagger the imagination. We have been died for. If we had just been died for by another person, that would be the, that would be the cause for endless gratitude, wouldn't it? Different, your God died for you. I 
know, I feel some of you are saying doctrinal heresy creeping in here. Be patient. The one who gave himself for us on the cross of Calvary is the second person of the Trinity. It's surprised, it's surprising that we aren't more astonished. Does the Bible really say that God incarnate died for us? Yes, it does. That's why I read Acts 20, 28. If you want to look at it again, just for a minute, we're back to our verse we started with. Acts 20, 28. It says, Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseer to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. The antecedent of he is God. Now I know that Darby, when he translated the scriptures, he changed this slightly. He said, which he purchased with the blood of his own. Of course, that's true too. But it, all, the, all the other versions of the Bible translated just this way. God, which he, God, purchased with his own blood. You know, I believe that verse is in the Bible just for its shock value. So it just shocked the wits out of us when we think of something like that. You say, well, is that the only verse in the Bible? No, it's amazing. It's amazing when you look at other scriptures. Uh, Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. We're not going to read the chapter, but just let me refer to it briefly. Um, the Spirit dwells in this chapter at considerable length on the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. First of all, he's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Verse 15. He's the creator of all things. Verse 16. He's the one who is before all things and by whom all things consist. Verse 17. Yet yeah, difference in that same context after giving this glowing description of the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ, verse 14, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. In whom? Whom? God the Son. And then if you go to Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3, Hebrews chapter 1, and verse 3. This is really startling, friends. We're so familiar with these verses. Do we realize what they're saying? Verse 3. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power. Dear friends, that just spells one thing. Deity, doesn't it? Isn't that talking about the deity of the Lord Jesus? Who being the brightness of his glory the express image of his person. That doesn't mean he was like God. It means he was God. Upholding all things by the word of his prayer. Listen to the next part of the verse. When he had by himself purged our sins. Who? <laughs> the brightness of his glory. The express image of his person. The upholder of all things by the word of his power. When he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. I think that's marvelous. And of course you have it again in Philippians. It's marvelous how the scriptures open up on this subject when you take a second look at them. Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2 verse 5, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Notice, who being in the form of God. What does that mean? It means he was God. What does it mean? That's a statement of the absolute deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thought it not robbery to be equal with God. He was equal with God. And in that same context, after giving this description of the total deity of the Lord Jesus Christ, Paul writes in verse 8, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. 
Dear friends, in some religions, men and women die for their God. But I never heard of another religion where their God dies for his creatures. Have you? We never really, I don't think we ever really come to grips with Calvary until we stand before the cross and gaze on the Lord Jesus Christ there and realize that it is God incarnate who is dying there. Of course, this raises questions. I know they're in your mind already. You say, well, can God die? Well, you say, God is, um, God is spirit, and spirit doesn't have flesh and blood. And we read that God purchased the church with his blood. Spirit doesn't have flesh and blood. No, but the incarnation solves that problem, where God came down and veiled his Godhead in a body of flesh. Aside, he threw his most divine array and veiled his Godhead in a garb of clay. And in that garb, this wondrous love display, restoring what he never took away. But somebody will say to me, but Brother McDonald, God is immortal. And immortal means not subject to death. And that's true, God is immortal. And he's not subject to death. But in the Incarnation, the Lord Jesus made himself subject to death. That's why he took on a human body, so that as man he might die for you and me. Jesus was made a little lower than the angels for the sufferings of death. That he, by the grace of God, might taste death for every one. The Lord Jesus is not God minus something. He's God plus something. But that something is humanity. Isaac Watts, I love that man's writings, he realized that the one who died for him was none other than, the, than Christ, his God. He said, Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast save in the death of Christ my All the vain things that charm me most, I'd sacrifice them to his blood. He had no trouble with that, did he? And neither should you arrive. All right. Char, like that, Charles Wesley, he faced this fact, this problem. God is immortal. How can one who's immortal become subject to death? And he said, this mystery all. The immortal dies. Who can explore his strange design? In vain, the firstborn seraph tries to plumb the depths of love. But the mystery didn't deter Charles Weston because he went on to say, and dear friends, you sing it all the time, amazing love. How can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die? Right? And you know, we can sing it and not gasp. <laughs> we can sing it and not gasp. Well, there's another question arises. If Jesus is God, and God incarnate died for us, who ran the universe when his body was three days and three nights in the grave? <laughs> That's a good one. There's no problem at all. Dear friends, only Jesus' body went to the grave. He didn't go to the grave. The moment the Lord Jesus died, it's in paradise. Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. At one moment he's running all things here on earth. As a man, as a God man here on earth. The next minute he's running them all in heaven and there's no interlude. No interlude. Mm -hmm. So it really isn't a problem. It really isn't a problem. There was no interval during which he was not in complete control. You know, the amazing fact that the Supreme Being gave himself for us is nothing less than astounding. And I want to tell you that the most brilliant efforts to describe it, including my efforts tonight, are no better than a stutter. That's how marvelous 
it really is. It strains the brain to realize that what happened at Calvary was not homicide. That's where one man kills another man. It was not genocide. That's where men try to wipe out an ethnic, cultural, national group. Dear friends, the death of the Lord Jesus on the cross of Calvary was deicide, the murder of God. You have taken, Peter said, and by cruel hands have crucified and slain. Spurgeon said, who would have thought of the just ruler dying for the unjust rebel? There's no teaching. This is no teaching of human mythology. The Son of God loved me and gave himself for me. And yet he said, we can say that and either gasp or weep. And this is marvelous. That we can say it and neither gasp or weep. We reel off similar verses with little or no emotion. We preach this truth so blandly and mannerly or factly that it doesn't bring our listeners to their knees. God help us from much of the preaching that goes on today in the shadow of Calvary. We're guilty of what someone called the curse of a dry-eyed Christianity. Constantly, we need to come back to the awesome reality that the one who died on the cross of Calvary is Jesus, God incarnate. I think F.W. Pitt said it well when he wrote those memorable lines, the maker of the universe as man for man was made a curse. The claims of law that he had made unto the uttermost he paid. His holy fingers made the bough which grew the thorns that crowned his brow. The nails that pierced his hands were mined in secret places he designed. He made the forest whence there sprung the tree on which his body hung. He died upon a cross of wood that made the hill on which it stood. The sky that darkened o'er his head by him above the earth was spread. The sun that hid from him its face by his decree was poised in space. The spear that spilled his precious blood was tempered and the fires of God. The grave in which his form was laid was hewn in rock his hands had made. The throne on which he now appears was his from everlasting years, and a new glory crowns his brow, and every knee to him shall bow. Amen. I want to tell you, dear friends, the marvel of the death of the one who threw the farthest galaxies into space is just, just strains the brain, that's all I can say. But it's true just the same. It's true just the same. Did you know that isn't the whole story? The third thing is the people for whom he died. And I think we'll just wait till tomorrow morning and think about that. But tonight, before you go to bed, just think about this. Think of the marvel of the death of the Christ of God upon the cross of Calvary. Think of men taking him and putting him to death and all the time they're doing it, their very lives depended on him for every minute that they were doing. Their lives were dependent upon him. The breath that they took were dependent upon him. And yet he submitted to that. It was all for you and for me. Wonderful, wonderful Jesus. Dear friends, I hope that as a result of our little conference, if nothing else happens this week, 
that it will go away with a deeper appreciation of what happened at Calvary. We kind of think, well, he died as a man, you know, we kind of soften the blow. But you can't divide the you can't divide the person of the Lord Jesus like that. You can't say, well, it was just as man he died. He's the God man. You can't separate those parts of him. It was Jesus, God incarnate, who died on Calvary's cross. Shall we pray? Father, forgive us for so often reading the scriptures and reciting verses and their wonder doesn't explode on us. We say so glibly, the Son of God loved me and gave himself for me. We really don't realize what we're saying. We really don't realize what we're saying. Lord, we would pray that prayer to that. Oh, make me understand it. Help me to take it in. But it meant to thee, the Holy One, to bear away our sin. Help us to remember who you are. Not that you're just someone like ourselves. But you're the one to whom we owe every breath that we take. Write these truths deeply upon our hearts, we pray in the Savior's name.